And many things had to happen that would not have happened if it was the Sabbath day. So there is a reason why Passover is not a Sabbath day. We'll be talking more about that. How did Passover come about? Well, uh, if you listen to the message from Elder Rusty last night, you heard a lot about it. And, uh, but basically, you know, uh, when, a, when a famine occurred in the land of Israel and Jacob and his family came to Egypt and his son Joseph was second in command at that time through all kinds of a series of wonderful events, the Hebrews lived there for 400 years. But then there arose a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. And because the Hebrews were multiplying really fast, he began to kill the firstborn male child of everyone that was born. So when Moses was born, his sister and his mother hid him, and eventually the daughter of Pharaoh found him floating in a river in a basket, and she adopted him, and he became a prince of Egypt at that time. Somehow or another, he found out that the, the Hebrews were his relatives, probably through his mom or his sister, and uh, he ended up killing an Egyptian shoulder, sh soldier that was beating a Hebrew. He fled Egypt at that time into the land of Midian, where Mount Sinai is today in northern Saudi Arabia. He fled there, and there he talked to God at the burning bush. And at the burning bush, God says, you're going back to Pharaoh, and you're going to tell him to let my people go. So, of course, Moses like, what? Me? Who? Me? What, what can I do? You're asking me to go and talk to the most powerful man in the world to tell him to let the Hebrews go? This is a suicide mission. He didn't say that, but you know that's what he was thinking. And so God said, tell him I am sent you, that I will be with you, Moses. And so Moses went, got with his brother Aaron who was there, and, be and began to approach Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. Of course, Pharaoh says, who is this God that I should obey him? Who is he? I know no such God, because remember the Egyptians had a ton of gods. And so Moses says, you will get to know him really soon. And so God began to send plagues down upon Egypt. And each one, Pharaoh refused to let the people go. Plagues about water turning to blood, frogs, lice, flies, cattle disease, boils, hail and fire, locusts, great darkness. All these plagues fell upon the Egyptians, but it did not hurt the Hebrews, which were in the land of Goshen, which is at the Nile Delta of Egypt. And so all these different plagues, and every time uh, Pharaoh would refuse to let the people go. Even the priest of Pharaoh saying, hey, this is the finger of God. You need to pay attention. But Pharaoh was so lifted up with pride, he wasn't about to let the Hebrews go. So finally the last plague came, which was the death of the firstborn. And most of you know what happened there. Is God gave instructions to the Hebrews how to escape the angel of death that was coming upon the land of Egypt to avoid having the firstborn of every family killed by this angel of death. And so, as we know, make a long story short, that Pharaoh's son, firstborn son, was killed by this angel of death. And at that point, he let the Hebrews go. But prior to that, in Exodus chapter 11 and 12, God gave instruction to the Hebrews how to escape the angel of death that was coming to kill the firstborn male of every family. So God told Moses to tell the people that God would go into the land of Egypt at midnight and kill the firstborn. You can read that in Exodus 11, 4 through 6. And then Pharaoh will let you go. So beginning in Exodus 12, the instructions for Passover began. The Lord tells them that this month, the month in the sun, right now, the month we're in the month in the sun right now, will be the beginning of months for the years. Just a few days ago, we celebrated Rosh Chodesh of Nisan. It's the biblical new year, the Nisan. So on the 14th of this month, which is where Passover is. But on the 10th of that month, the Lord commanded the Hebrews to take a lamb without blemish into their house. They were to take this lamb, they examine all the lambs and take one without blemish. So what does it mean without blemish? This is talking about that it's not blind, it's not lame. It doesn't matter what color it was. It's just not blind, it wasn't lame, you know, and, or anything like that. So, so that would represent sin. And, and spiritually speaking here, would represent sin. So they were to take a lamb, spiritually speaking, without sin, into their household. And it must be a young male lamb. That was the instructions. And you will keep it in your family 
to the 14th of Nisan. So for four days this lamb is to be observed and dwell among them. These four days one will get attached to the lamb and also observe that the lamb is sure to have no blemish on the lamb itself. And so on the 10th of Nisan to the 14th, the family is supposed to be looking at this lamb, the Passover lamb that was brought into their house. And of course, that will be the Passover lamb that will save them from the angel of death that will pass through the land of Egypt. Remember that Yeshua entered Jerusalem four days prior to his crucifixion. The crowds cried, Hosanna. This was on a Sabbath. It was not on a Sunday. There was no Palm Sunday. If you want to call it Palm Shabbat, you could call it Palm Shabbat. Why do we say that? Because he went to Bethany and Bethphage from Jericho the day before. The reason why he went that close to Jerusalem and Bethany because it was within what you would call a Sabbath day journey. The rabbi says you could not walk any more than 2,000 cubics on the Sabbath. So Yeshua left Friday to get before the sun went down and got to Bethany from Jericho. And there they actually had pillars around Bethphage and Bethany were right next to one another that said these were the Sabbath day's journey. And on the Sabbath no one was, was a venture beyond those points. So Yeshua wanted to make sure he got there before the Sabbath started. That's why we know <clears throat> that he went there on a Friday night in a big hurry and got there before the sun went down. <clears throat> the next day when he went into Jerusalem, just like uh, 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 Elder Regine was talking about, it was a very high Sabbath at that time, a great Sabbath. Uh, so there were multitudes and multitudes gathered in Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Not a Sunday. It was on a Sabbath. That's why there were multitudes of people there. And when Yeshua come riding in, they're all going, Hosanna, Hosanna, save now. There are multitudes of people. N couldn't be a Sunday. Sunday's a work day. They all would have been working at their jobs and crafts. It was a sub Sabbath day. There was no Palm Sunday. That's a church creation long time ago. But this would have been on the Sabbath day at this time. So, uh, and understand that if, if Saturday was the day that he rode into Jerusalem, then we also know that he was crucified later. And this would mean that he had been crucified on a Wednesday night. And we'll talk some more about that in a moment. Exodus 12, 6 said the Hebrews were to keep the lamb until the 14th of Nisan and then kill it. So during these four days that Yeshua came into Jerusalem, he was being examined by his family, the Jewish people in Jerusalem during this period of time. So for four days, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes, and the people constantly asked him questions to examine him. What happened in those four days with Yeshua? He cursed the fig tree. He threw the money changers out. He gave a faith message based off the fig tree. He talked about prayer. He talked about forgiveness. He talked about the baptism of John, whether it was heaven or of men. He gave the parable of the vineyard and the tower, which is talking about Israel and the temple. And, and at that point, the leaders in Jerusalem wanted to stone him, wanted to kill him, because he they knew exactly that he was condemning them. Because in that parable, it said he sent a servant, and they beat the servant up. They sent another servant, and they bent that servant up. They sent the third servant, and they beat that servant up. So then the owner said, I'll send my son, and they will rever him. But when they sent his son, they killed his son. And the leaders there in Jerusalem understood right away that was talking about Yeshua, and Yeshua made them mad, and they wanted to kill him right then. But they were afraid of the people who were all enamored by him at that time. He answered questions about the resurrection that the Sadducees were asking him. They asked whether to give tribute to Caesar or not. They asked if he was the son of David, which he described that he was. And then he wore, be, be, beware of the scribes who wear long clothes and love salutations in the chief seats and devour women's houses and pretense of long prayers. They will receive the greater damnation, it said. So, Religious people can receive a greater damnation if they're not operating in the what Yeshua talked about, and it's all for show. Before the people, they can receive a greater damnation. Leaders of all people of the church 
should be humble people and be servants of the Lord. They should not be up there promoting themselves. Because a lot of them are accused of that and when they're not guilty of that. So we have to be careful of that too. But there are many who promote themselves for riches and finances and, and because they, they, they love the salutations. They love to be in the chief seats. They love to be, you know, better than anybody else concept. Most of my congregation knows me. I'll be more than willing to sit in the back, <laughs> but they won't let me. <laughs> you know, you have to keep a humble heart. You have to serve the Lord with a humble heart. He talked about the greatest and second greatest commandments. He talked about the widow who gave the two mites. He talked about the temple will be destroyed and arose and, 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 and rebuilt in three days. He talked about the woman with the ointment of an alabaster box. And how she will be known when this, this story was told. And we now see that in the scriptures. We don't know who that woman was. But that woman who anointed Yeshua with that ointment, it is placed in the gospel today. One day when we're all up there in the kingdom and talking to everybody, we're going to meet that woman probably. She said, oh, I was the one that anointed his feet. <laughs> oh, that was you. What was your name? We don't know who that was. It'd be kind of fun to find out. That's when Judas betrayed the Messiah. And of course, then they had the Passover meal. All in this period of the four days of uh, Yeshua being examined, whether or not he was, in fact, a Passover lamb. You've got to understand, on Tuesday night, which would have been the Last Supper, in that, in that 24 hour period, he had the Passover supper. He went in the Garden of Eden and he or Gethsemane and he prayed. He was arrested. He had a trial and he was crucified and he died. All in 24 hours of Passover. So when the disciples sat down that Tuesday night to have Passover supper, that was the beginning of Passover. You must remember the day begins in the evening. The day begins in the evening. So right when the sun went down, it started with the Passover meal at that time. And Yeshua, that's when he told us about the bread and the wine to do this often in his name in remembrance of him. That was what they called the minchal. That was the anointing of the sacrifices that are given, a covenant anointing upon the sacrifices even long before this last supper. But Yeshua showed them these things because he was going to be that sacrifice and he was showing them how to do the minchal. So when you do communion or new covenant Passover, that's what you are doing in his honor to remember him. And it's a covenant, establishing a covenant with the Lord himself. Amen? Amen. Wow. <clears throat> remember that Yeshua was taken down from the cross at the end of Passover near sundown because... That was the beginning of the next Moed in the Bible of Leviticus 23, known as the, the Moed of Unleavened Bread. And that began in the evening time at sundown. This seven-day Moed had two Sabbath days, the first and seventh day of the seven-day celebration or Sabbath. you got to remember, there are seven other Sabbaths in the Bible other than weekly Sabbath. So when John 19.31 says that he had to be taken down from the cross because the high Sabbath was at hand, it's not talking about the Shabbat Haggadol of the week before. It was talking about right then and there he had to be taken down because of a high Sabbath. That was not a weekly Sabbath. It was a high Sabbath, the first day of unleavened bread. And Yeshua had to be taken down, which would have been on a Thursday, that evening, Wednesday evening would have been on a Thursday, so they had to take him down from the cross. There was no Good Friday. You could say it was a Good Wednesday if you want. There was no Good Friday. So they took him down before the sun went down on Thursday, which was also a preparation day to get ready for the seven days Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's when preparation day. What is preparation day? That's when you have the search for the leaven. That's when you remove all the leaven out of your house. That's what the preparation day was. What did that mean spiritually? Remove all the leaven out of the house. It's talking about us. Once we have Passover, then we are to get all the leaven out of our lives, which represents sin. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says, Christ is our Passover. And you are unleavened. Remove the leaven of wickedness and malice out of your life. 
So first you must believe in the Passover lamb. And after that you cleanse yourself by the Passover lamb and remove all the leaven out of your life. Very, very important that order is taking place just like that. So we understand. First the lamb, then clean your life up. I've heard multitudes of people say, well, once I clean my life up, I'll start going back to church. Or I'll believe in the lamb of oh, Jesus. Wrong order, folks. Believe in Yeshua and he will help you clean your life up. If you don't do that, you're in the wrong order and you never will do that. You've got to get in the right order. Get the leaven out of your life. Very important that we do that. <clears throat> Exodus 12, 7 says they were to take the blood of the lamb and put on the sides and upper doorposts of their house. They were to eat the now roasted lamb in their house. So that family and any other family members or guests invited into the house so they could eat the whole lamb, they were to put that, they were to kill the lamb and then put the blood on the doorpost of the house. What do you think that represents? What is your doorpost? It's your heart, it's your mind, it's your spiritual part of your body. You enter a house through the door. So in order for Yeshua to appropriate his blood in, the, in your life, he's got to come through the door. So you appropriate the blood in your heart and in your mind. And there you are cleansed and, uh, of your sins and protected from the angel of death. So the angel of death will pass over you. That's that final judgment that God has got set forth for all of mankind. You want that judgment to pass. There's another scripture that tells you that angel of death was none other than God himself. He will be the one that will execute that judgment on the wicked upon the earth. We are covered by the blood to forgive our iniquities and defilement of death. Death is destroyed because we continually eat of the lamb spiritually. That's why we do the new covenant Passover or communion. <clears throat> Exodus 12, 8 tells us that we are to eat the lamb with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Unleavened bread represents sinlessness. Paul called us, told us in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7 and 8, that we are unleavened bread. And you've heard me say this many times. You are the righteousness of God. You are unleavened. Christ makes us unleavened. He purges our sin. So don't shame his name. Don't fail to sanctify his name by not walking in righteousness. Don't lose your testimony. You're not going to lose your salvation. But you certainly can lose your testimony and your rewards and position in the kingdom. And be ashamed at that beam of seat judgment of the Messiah when he hands out the crowns and rewards and the, our garments of light. How would you like to be standing before him and say, well, I had this for you and I had that for you, but you didn't walk in my name. You didn't walk in my righteousness. So, you know, here you are. Glad you made it, but I have nothing for you. What a sad day that would be. Can you imagine going to church all your life and being told at the last minute the judgment, the bema seat of the Messiah, that all your works are burned up, you have nothing to honor God with? Wow. That would be a sad day in, in, for sure. Yeah, you're going to be glad you were saved. You're going to be glad you make it. But everybody else will see you too. And everybody going to say, where's your garment of light? Well, well, where's your crown? Well, well. Where's your throne? Where's your throne in the middle of those thrones? Well, well, well. You want to tell people that kind of stuff? You want to answer those kind of questions? It's shameful that you have nothing, nothing to show of your faith of the Lord. And what you've done, the two greatest commandments. You people say, well, what must I do? The two great commandments is a good start. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might. The second one is to love your neighbor as yourself. Yeshua said, if you love me, keep my commandments, it says. Folks, this is just not empty rhetoric. These are not empty words I'm saying. This is serious stuff. Very serious stuff. And all you guys watching out there. I know most of you are already born again and believers and serving the Lord. And that's wonderful. But if any of you out there are not serving the Lord and believing right now, you, need to, you really need to have, grab a hold of what I'm talking about. You need Yeshua in your life. You need him deeply in your life. You need to eat of him, which means to, to take everything he's ever said and appropriate it in your life. This is important, extremely important things 
that's taking place. Oh, that was just for the Jews. <laughs> well, let me read a scripture for you. Exodus 12, verse 43 to 49. I'm just going to pick and choose a little bit here, but you can read them yourself. Exodus 12, 43 for 49. It said, No stranger shall eat of the Passover lamb. However, any stranger that wants to sojourn with you and will keep Passover and is circumcised, then he shall be one that is born in the land with you. Caleb was one of those guys. Caleb was an Edomite. And he was a major character with the Hebrews in the promised land and in the wilderness. Caleb was not born a Jew. But he was accepted as a Jew because he celebrated Passover with Israel. What, ha what does that mean today? When you have Yeshua, you are celebrating Passover. You have him. And to be circumcised, we're not talking about circumcision of the flesh. We are talking about circumcision of the heart. That you have a different heart. That you are serving the Lord God. This is all what they call born again in John. John 3 is talking about born again. The concept that you have Yeshua or Passover, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And when you have him, you become unleavened at that time. Now you walk in righteousness. That's why Paul says at that moment, you'll get the leaven out of your life. He actually says, purge it out of your life. Get rid of the leaven out of your life, which is sin. So if you have Yeshua, you have life. And if you purge the leaven out of your life, great will you be in the kingdom of God. In a position in the kingdom. We're not playing games. This is not games, folks. This is serious business. You know, at a time in the world we may be on the cusp of the tribulation period, and we're playing games today, and just let the word of God just flow right by us. Oh, that was a nice sermon. Oh, that was a nice words. Forget nice sermons. Grab a hold of the truth. That's what's important. I mean, you preachers out there that turn around and just give anecdotes all the time and sayings all the time and think, what a good boy am I? I put my thumb in the pie and pulled out a plum? Wrong. You need to be talking the truth. You need to be speaking to people. You've got to deliver people. You've got to let them know what's coming upon this earth. And they've got to know the truth even the day where they're still breathing. They've got to understand. I don't want to be in the shoes of of pastors who God gave them people to teach and they teach them nonsense. Teach them nonsense. I mean, oh, hymnals, open up the hymnals and look into some of the, the hymnals that are in the, their hymnal books. Hymnals, songs written by John Lennon of the Beatles. Imagine there's no heaven. That's, that's paganism. But they sing those songs in their churches. Is there no life in those kind of churches that they can't sing praises and honor unto God? they got to sing stuff like that? That's sad. Very sad indeed. We need to have a great awakening. And maybe this coronavirus is going to begin to do it. I don't know. I mean, I was shocked the other day that a CNN reporter, you know, that fake news CNN, was talking to T.D. Jakes on an interview. And T.D. Jakes was talking about the coronavirus and whether this could be the end times and all that. You know what that CNN reporter said to him? Pastor, right now while we're live on the air, would you pray for me in this country? CNN asked T.D. Jakes to pray live. When I saw that, I said, there is a God! <laughs> It's changing people's hearts today. And what are we doing about it as believers? Are we, are we hiding ourselves, sequestering ourselves spiritually? Hope not. Sequestering ourselves physically is one thing. But sequestering ourselves spiritually is something else. We never, never sequester ourselves spiritually. Ever. You got a phone. Talk to people. You got ways to communicate. Talk to people. And you've heard me say it before many, many times. The end is not near. The end is here. Now it might be 40 years from now, but that is really near when you figure out the 6,000 years of existence of mankind on the earth. That's very near. Very close. 
We need to wake up. I mean, I, if I had a soapbox, I'd stand on it. Uh, I got to laugh about things some, sometimes here, you know. Folks, our Lord, our God is precious to us. Amen. If he's not precious to you, you need to get precious right now with him. Well, we are to eat bitter herbs, which is talking about persecution that we suffer for our beliefs. Do you know in, in Acts 14, it actually says that through much tribulation, you enter the kingdom of God. If you are a believer, you should be expected to be persecuted. Spoken about, slandered, whatever. If you've never been persecuted for your belief, then probably nobody knows that you believe or you're not standing for your belief. It comes with the territory. There's bitter herbs with the territory. If you're not being persecuted for that, then you're not really walking the way God wants you. The Beatitudes say, Blessed are those who are persecuted for the righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. You have... It comes with it. Now, you don't go out there deliberately to be persecuted. You don't go out there deliberately and, and, and slap some big guy in the face and say, Okay, persecute me. That's just stupid. You were asking for trouble. But because of your faith and you're being persecuted, that is part of the plan of God. To be persecuted for the plan of God. Amen? Amen. You are to leave nothing of the Lamb until morning. We are to completely eat the Lamb of God. You see this Exodus 12, verse 10. We are completely to embrace Him. We can't pick and choose what parts we like and throw the rest away. You eat the whole lamb. That's what it commands the family to do. To roast and eat the whole lamb and leave none of it until morning. And if, you have a, if you're a small group and can't eat all the lamb or you're eating all you can, then you are to burn it. But we are to completely take the lamb. Now what does that mean spiritually speaking? You take everything Yeshua said. You don't pick and choose how you want to believe. You don't interject your concepts and ideas into it. You interject what Yeshua said into it. And you follow those concepts. When Yeshua said this, you are to do it. Well, I don't like that part. I'm going to take this part. It's like taking the Bible and he's saying what pages you don't like and start ripping them out. I don't like that one. I don't like that one. I'm going to take that one out too. No. You take all of it. You eat all of the lamb. If he says love your enemies, you love your enemies. If he says love one another, you love one another. All these concepts that Yeshua said, you don't pick and choose. And people out today, that's all they are doing is picking and choosing today. Well, that's a nice statement. That's really nice. Well, you know, there's more to God than just being nice. There's a lot of judgment of God coming. And that's not so nice. Are we alert? Are we awake? Are we ready for that? <clears throat> we to eat with our gurns loins girded and staff in hand, shoes on our feet, eat it in haste. What does that mean? You don't delay. You do it now. You don't decide, well, I'm going to believe in Yeshua and follow him when this happens or when that happens, whatever. You could be too late. You could be too late. You must in haste adapt and grab the lamb today. That's important. Exodus 12 Verse 12 and 13 basically says the Lord will pass through the land. And if he sees the blood, he will pass over you and judge you not. That's where we get the term Passover. When the angel of death came through Egypt and the and angel of death saw the blood on the door, he just went to the next house. If he saw the blood on that house, he went to the next house. Until he got to a house where there was no blood and he killed the firstborn in that family. Pharaoh lost his only son. And he let the Hebrews go. He changed his mind later and went after to kill them all. And God protected them at the Red Sea. He, the Lord split the Red Sea. The Hebrews crossed. When Pharaoh tried to cross the split Red Sea to kill the Hebrews, the Hebrews got the other side first. And the Lord let the Red Sea destroy Pharaoh's army. Crash back down upon them. And even today, there's a place in the Red Sea down there where they found chariot wheels 
in the ocean there. Some of those wheels were crusted with metal, you know, silver and gold and all that, and they saw the form, the wood rotted away, but they saw the form of the wheels down among the coral and algae down the bottom. We know that was a crossing of the Red Sea of the Hebrews cross right there at Noeba Beach. Noeba Beach. I've been at Noeba Beach. I didn't know that was the spot when I was there. Yeah. If I would have known that spot, I probably would have been in the water. Now check it out. It was right at the end of a large wadi, which means you know a, 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 a runoff of rain, and surrounded by all these solid rock hills and mountains. The Hebrews came through that wadi, and all of a sudden there's this huge beach. That's where they were stopped. That's where God split the Red Sea. How do we know that was the spot? Because I was probably standing next to it and had no idea what it was. There was a pillar that was falling down right there. And I couldn't read ancient Hebrew. I didn't know what it was. Oh, there, there was a, you, know, you see pillars all over the place in those lands. Well, somebody interpreted that writing on that pillar. It was by King Solomon. And it said on there, The crossing of the Hebrews. I found that later, much later, not while I was there. But I, I can picture it in my mind, Nueva Beach. Oh my gosh, I wish I would have known that. That's back when Israel had control of the Sinai. After Israel gave up control of Sinai, I would not go in there. Nobody should go in there right now. It's, it's a dangerous place where a lot of terrorists live in that area. Nueva Beach. And on the other side of the, Nueva, all, other side of the Red Sea, they found another pillar saying crossing of the Hebrews. That's where they crossed when they started their journey toward Mount Sinai. Right there. Wasn't in a marshy mire like, like secular people tried to say that there must have been a big old wind and God separated the waters and let the Hebrews cross in this mire? Why do people try to always interject some kind of a, a secular explanation for miracles in the Bible? Do you not know that there are miracles? God does miracles in the Bible? You're going to be surprised because a lot more are coming. A lot more are coming yet. Wow. Exodus 12, 14 says, It shall be a memorial, and you shall keep it unto the Lord, an ordinance forever. An ordinance forever. If you have Yeshua and you're born again in your life, that is an ordinance forever. But why don't we celebrate it regardless? Why aren't we celebrating? That's how you learn. That's how you understand the promises of God and all that he did. Some of the things I talked about today... 99% of church people don't even know what I just finished talking about. They don't have a clue. What do you mean he was crucified on a Wednesday night? What do you mean he entered Jerusalem on a Saturday, on a Sabbath day? These were traditions the church set up probably somewhere around 300 and 400 A.D. They started setting up these traditions. Because they cut themselves off from Hebraic roots, teachings, and concepts. So they don't know. They don't know. Wow. Wow. You should have seen the people in India and Africa grab a hold of these things. When I was over there teaching the, you know, thousands of people, they're all going, wow, that makes sense. If Yeshua was not crucified on a Wednesday night and rose from the dead late Saturday night, how did he get three days and three nights in the tomb if it wasn't then? You cannot get three days and three nights in the tomb on a Friday night. It doesn't compute. I mean, many years ago when I was a believer, I, I looked at that scripture and go, kept trying to count out, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I'm not seeing something. I'm not seeing it. It doesn't add up. It doesn't add up. I would make little partial days and get the three days, but I could never get the three nights. So like, what's wrong here? Now I know better that it wasn't a Friday night. And I came to an understanding it was a Wednesday night. Now you get the three full days and three full nights. That's how we know about it today. This is very, very encouraging to people studying the scriptures that everything that God said is true. And you can believe what he said is true. It's always our own understanding that gets out of line. Exodus 12, 46 says, No bones can be broken of the Passover lamb. Now that would be a feat. I'd like to watch a dinner table on that one. You got a roasted lamb right here, and the father's going, whatever you do, don't break any bones. What do you mean, Dad? How can we eat all if we don't break bones? 
figure out a way, but don't break any bones. That's a commandment. Don't break any bones of the Passover lamb. It's also mentioned in Numbers 9, verse 12. Don't break any bones. So you can see the family trying to pick the meat off or all the right rib cages and hips and everything else off this. Be careful not to break any bones. Now, why was it that God said don't break any bones? Why would God care if you broke a bone as long as you're eating the Passover lamb? Because it was prophetic. It was prophetic. Yeshua did not have any bones broken on his body. He was crucified with two other people that had their legs broken. But when it came to break Yeshua's leg, now why would they want to break Yeshua's legs? you got to understand crucifixions, how it all works. When I was in Israel and archaeological digs there, I learned a lot from the people there of the sites they found, the place of, of execution there on the north, outside the north wall by Golgotha, the place of the skull. That was a place of stoning and execution. They found finger bones all over that place when they do an archaeological dig. When people would throw rocks at people and stone them, sometimes they would sever the fingers. So they found finger bones in there. And then they found evidences of people being crucified in the past. In the museum, they even got ankle bones with a spike still in it. How they're crucified. So at that point, I learned that Yeshua was crucified on the road to Damascus, right in front of Golgotha, right on the busiest road in Jerusalem. He was crucified right there off the side of the road. You got to deal, you know what you're dealing with? The brutality of the Romans. The brutality of the Romans. The Romans were not going to do anything to cause them a lot of work. They killed lots of people, and they can only handle so much a daily doing these kind of things. They lined the roads of crucified people. So this romantic idea that Yeshua was crucified on the hill with two other people. Oh, look at three crosses up there. You see the three crosses and all that? It spoke about Yeshua and two being crucified with him. But daily people are being crucified. And where were they being crucified? Right on the side of the road or the road of Damascus. Now why would they do that? Because if you put a sign up there and said, Yeshua, King of the Jews... You're not going to see it on a hill. We don't know what that sign says. It's too far away. No, they wanted you to see it. And they wanted to know that right there when you walk by, as close as I am to everybody right here, they walked by him and saw Yeshua, King of the Jews, written in all those different languages. Because the Romans wanted to make a point. They're not going to drag anybody up a hill. I'm not saying the Romans were lazy, but they probably were lazy. They killed so many people, they're not going to go on top of a hill. And they want to make a point of the crucifixion. So they did it right there on the road to Damascus. The busiest road in Jerusalem. So when people walk by, they're looking right at Yeshua's face. Now he wasn't high up on a cross. That's too much work for the Romans. What they know now understand when they say he bore his cross and carried his cross, it was a cross member. That's what was called a cross. It was a cross member. It was not the vertical stake because they already had vertical stakes in place all up and down that road. They had this as a weld oil machine to do this a lot, the Romans did. They're not going to constantly be taking big crosses and putting them in the ground. They had just left vertical crosses or poles there. Then they come down and Yeshua is carrying this vertical uh, horizontal cross and they lay him down and they put the nails in the wrist. That's what we understand today. You put, they put the nails in the wrist. And they hammered him to that horizontal cross. And then using ropes, they lifted the horizontal cross up on top of the vertical staff that was standing up, the vertical pole that was standing up. More than likely, his feet were still touching the ground. He was like this, so it's stretched out like this. And then, after they got him secured up there, they came over and bent his knees up, then hammered his ankles into that pole. Because that, that archaeological where they found the nail in that person's foot was the ankle. It wasn't on top where all the little bones are, neither was it here, you know, in his hands. They hammered it in his ankles. And he actually had both legs together like this with his knees bent. He was up there like this. So when the people walked by, they would see the agony in his face. And his followers gathered around him, really close to him. They heard every word he said. They saw every blood drop that fell. They saw all the sweat coming off of him. 
That's how he was crucified. These are things we know today that church did not know a long time ago. Right on the side of the road. And because the high Sabbath was at hand, they, they went around and broke the legs of the other two thieves. And when they got to Yeshua, they found him already dead. So they did not break his legs. Now why was it important to break the legs? Because they would just keep pushing themselves up on the ankle nails, <gasps> take another breath of air, because you're suffocating. And they just kept that up. So you, you, you linger for hours, slowly suffocating like that. But when they break their legs, they can't push up on him, or so they quickly suffocate and die. But they already found Yeshua dead, so they did not break any bones. As fulfillment of the prophecy, you shall break no bones of the Passover lamb. No bones of the Passover lamb. Well, Exodus 34, 25 says, You shall not offer blood of my sacrifices with leaven. This indicates that when we accept Yeshua and appropriate his blood into our lives, we are to live righteous lives and not live in sin. You cannot appropriate the Lamb of God and his blood in your life and mix leaven with it. What does that mean? You can't say, oh, Jesus, forgive me. I accept your blood and just turn the blind eye, Yeshua, as I commit all these sins. You cannot mix leaven with it. Deuteronomy 16.5 says, Passover is only offered where he puts his name. Jerusalem is where God puts his name. It's also where his son was offered. Jerusalem. There were two kings in the Bible before Yeshua that celebrated Passover. Hezekiah was one of them in 2 Chronicles 30 verse 1. He repaired the house of God and ordered Passover to be celebrated throughout the land. And he invited the remnants of the northern Israel after the Syrian captivity to join Passover. The scripture actually tells you in 2 Chronicles verse 30 verse 1 that Ephraim and Manasseh was, was invited. Verse 5 from Beersheba to Dan. That means from the south to the north. In verse 18 it even mentions Issachar and Zebulun were invited to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. Now how... How critical is that, understanding that? It's after the Assyrian captivity of the northern tribes. That tells you there were a lot of Israelites living in northern Israel even after the Assyrian captivity. So people say today, where are the lost tribes of Israel? Well, they might find a little remnant here and a little bit remnant there. But I, I'm pretty sure the people who call themselves Jews today is a mixture of all 12 tribes. Ephraim and Judah. Ephraim quite often is, is, because it was a large tribe, it represented the northern tribes of Israel. Ephraim. And it says when Ephraim and Judah would gather again together in the land. It's talking about the remnant that survived the Israeli captivity as well as the Jews of Judah and Benjamin and the Levites. They all became Israel again because of the Passover. Because of the Passover. Think about that. Because of the Passover, Hezekiah had a Passover feast and he invited all the tribes to Passover in Jerusalem. Spiritual fulfillment of that is one day all the tribes of Israel will accept the true Passover land and come to Jerusalem again someday. Isn't that amazing stuff we read about these things? Wow. Hezekiah kept Passover in the seventh or second month. Why was it the second month? When we said we're going to hold Passover in May, this is why we can do it. We, Hezekiah did it. So we're going to do it if, but if the virus doesn't release, we'll probably have to cancel that one too. But understand, Hezekiah celebrated Passover in the second month. Because when Hezekiah became king at 25 years old, he began to repair the temple because the doors were shut and he did what was right in the eyes of God. They ordered Passover to be celebrated. He removed the false altars and those that burned false incense. Many of the Levites be and helped the priests to kill the Passover on that second month. Because the Levites had a better heart toward God. And they prepared themselves quicker than the priests could. And the priests are the ones that are supposed to offer the Passover lamb. 
But the priests were not sanctified fast enough. But the Levites were. The Levites had a stronger heart toward God. And so Hezekiah used the Levites to do the Passover sacrifices. Even though the priests were supposed to do it. God will use whoever is willing and prepared themselves. We must understand that. Hezekiah wasn't going to worry about legalism at that point. He wanted to celebrate Passover. He removed the false altars. Wow. And so the, some priests and the Levites sanctified themselves even earlier in verse 15 of 2 Chronicles chapter 30. Hezekiah ordered the cleansing of the temple because the doors had been locked and shut because of wicked kings of Judah in the past. So now the doors were repair, repaired. And I really love 2 Chronicles 29, 12. So when, when Hezekiah began to read the word of the Lord to them and told them, we're going to have Passover, it says, and the Levites arose to do this job. What a great thing it's telling us. We need to arise. We need to stand up and be counted and do the work of God when a time comes that we should do it. And the temple was cleansed. And they finished on the 16th of Nisan after Passover. So instead of just having it then, they waited till the 14th of the next month to celebrate Passover at that time. And when they had Passover, they said it was great gladness in the land. And it was singing with loud instruments. Loud instruments, it said. Loud instruments. And they kept that Passover for seven days in honor of the Feast of Unleavened Bread also. The images were broken down. Once you have Yeshua, idolatry and sin should be removed from your lives. The next thing that happened you see in verse 4 of Chronicles uh, 31 says, And the hearts, people, the hearts of the people were changed and they were cleansed. And the people wanted to give. And they brought their tithes and their offering and their food to the temple. So much so it was overflowing. When you have a heart of people after God, when you have a heart of people that are grateful for the things that God has done for them, they want to give back. They want to give. They want to bring their tithes and their offerings and their first fruits and their produce or whatever they are growing, the tithes of that. They bring it to the temple to God. That's a natural response of believing in Yeshua. It's a natural response of the Holy Spirit in your life. You should want to give. If you don't like to give, you're really struggling with a personal relationship with God. I love to give. I give all the time. And you know what's given back to me? All the time. And all of you guys watch online, thank you for your offerings while you're gone. That keeps us going, keeps the doors open, pays electrical bills. But we're falling behind. So those of you watching today, you got to bring your tithes and offerings to the house of God. You can either do it online. We had people last week coming to their doors and giving us their offerings. We cracked the door open and they hand us their envelope and off they went. So don't forget us, folks. You need tithes. We need tithes and offerings to continue. The second king that did it was Josiah. And this was after the son of Hezekiah, Manasseh, which was the worst king that brought judgment upon Israel. He said, because of Manasseh, I'm going to destroy Israel. He was a bad king that offered children to the God of Moloch, live children burning them in fire to the God of Moloch. God let Manasseh rule for many years. And during that time, the temple was locked up and destroyed and fell in disarray. You know, God's patient. He waits. And he waits. Then Josiah, when he was a young man, became king. And as he grew up, a priest came and said, Hey, we found this book of law in the temple. Oh, well, read it to me. When Josiah heard those words, he, about, he probably about ready to fall over dead. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. What have we done? What have we done? So Jos Josiah ordered the temple to be cleansed and repaired. And images broken down and removed the 
false priests, the bad idolatrous priests, and kill them who worship false gods. These bad priests who used to call upon the name of the Lord were killed by Josiah. Bad leaders. Bad leaders who worshipped idols and brought sin into the house of God. The wizards were killed. The familiar spirits were killed. Abominations removed. The houses of the Sodomites were destroyed. Listen, America. The houses of the Sodomites were destroyed. That's great wickedness before God. And Josiah made a covenant to walk with the Lord in verse 3 of 2 Kings chapter 22. In verse 9, he said, The priests ate of unleavened bread also. But this was idolatrous priests, if you read this. They ate of the unleavened bread also. So these priests did not have a clean heart. And this is when we begin to mix church with sin. You're eating of the, of the leavened bread when you had a sinful heart. Wrong, as they say in Texas. Wrong. That's not what you're supposed to do. We are supposed to be righteous before the Lord. Amen? Amen. You cannot mix truth with idolatry. Ezekiel 45, 21, and 23. During the millennial reign of the Messiah, Passover is ordered to be observed on the 14th in the sun. And it says, keep the Passover and unleavened bread for seven days. So while Yeshua is reigning as king in Jerusalem, Passover and unleavened bread will be observed with the appropriate sacrifices. Yes, sacrifices are coming back. They're coming back, folks, during the millennial reign. Well, how can it be if Yeshua was the final sacrifice? He is for us. He is for us today. But when he comes back and we come with him, we already have our incorruptible bodies. We've already been delivered by the Lamb of God. The people living on earth at that time will be required to offer sacrifices. Because they'll see the King of Kings and Lord of Lords ruling out of Jerusalem. Grace and mercy doesn't apply anymore. We have grace and mercy today because we don't see God and we call upon his name and his mercy is great unto us. Without seeing. Blessed are those who believe and are not seen. But once he's in Jerusalem and they see him, they're held to a different rule at that time. That's why it says the law of the Lord, the Torah, will be established again. And they'll all have to follow Torah. That's what determines their righteousness at that time. Once the Lord comes back. You cannot say, oh, I see Yeshua said there. I guess it was all true what he said in the Bible. Okay, I believe now. No. You will obey now. You will obey now. During that thousand year millennial reign, the people still in the flesh on the earth will obey the Torah of God completely. It's a different situation now. Today we have the grace of God. Today we have the mercy of God. We call upon the name of the Lord. We call upon Yeshua, the Lamb of God. When he's ruling out of Jerusalem, it's now different. You can't say, oh, I see him now. All right, have mercy upon me, God. Not. Won't work then. He wants to see your obedience at that point. Amen? Amen. Well, okay, well, I, there was a lot said unpack this Passover today so I would encourage you to go back and listen to it again take notes get it down in your heart what Passover is all about and how it applies today have other people watch it your friends and family your neighbors your enemies whatever have them watch it understand what Passover is all about it's a great season it is a tremendous season it is our best season to have the Lamb of God in our lives. Amen? Amen? Okay, we're going to do offerings right now.